So for part two of World War II, what we're going to talk about is the war in Europe um, and, the, and the end of the war. So section B, the Pacific theater, wars are divided into what we call theaters. Uh, it's areas of operations, the front. So we start with number one, early Japan success in 1942. If you remember, in December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the Philippines and Hawaii, basically knocking out our Pacific fleet, or most of it, um, and also attacking the Philippines. And in 1942, the United States is going to have a difficult time in the early part of the uh, the, the year because we are going to be recovering from Pearl Harbor and our, our Pacific Army in the Philippines is surrounded. Um, they're not going to get reinforcements because we don't have any Navy to, to speak of really to bring them more reinforcements. And so we know we're going to lose all of the American troops, troops on the Philippines. And so the United States government is going to send a plane to rescue the general of the army on the Philippines, a guy by the name of General Douglas MacArthur. And they tell him that he's got to leave his troops behind. So he makes his troops a promise. He says, I shall return. Um, and so we fly him out. Now, it's hard to replace generals. We could replace privates and corporals, unfortunately, but um, it's, easier to replace gen it's easier to replace them, but not uh, generals to take years to train. Um, and so we see he is flown out of the Philippines, and shortly thereafter, the United States Army on the Philippines surrenders to the Japanese. The United States then gets word that the Japanese forced the U.S. soldiers, the prisoners of war, we can call them now, or POWs, they forced them to do what is called a death march. They marched them through the jungles of the Philippines um, and uh, on a forced march, which means they don't let them stop for much water or food or rest. And if you fall out of the line, the Japanese will kill you. And again, this is called the Bataan Death March. When Americans hear about this, it even heightens their anger against the Japanese even more. And this has an impact on the end of the war because Americans are angry at the Japanese. They want unconditional surrender. They want vengeance. They want to punish the Japanese for their attack on Pearl Harbor and also how they treated our POWs in Japan. And so we're going to see, like I said, this have an impact on American war expectations at the end. So number two, we have Midway and Leapfrogging. Midway is a battle that takes place in June of 1942. You can see it on the map, and it's a major aircraft carrier battle. We see in, in the Pacific and World War II a new kind of warfare. It's warfare not between ships that can see each other and, and they just you know hammer away at each other like battleships would. These are, these are battles between aircraft carriers. The Japanese launched their aircraft, the United States launched their aircraft, and the battles happen um, not we're in sight of each other. Um, and so we see the first major carrier battle in the Pacific at Midway, and it's American victory. Uh, the only boats that are not really that are important that are not going to be sunk at Pearl Harbor are the U.S. carriers. They were out of port that, w that day, and we're very fortunate that happened because now the United States can still engage the Japanese Navy at Midway. And from that point on, um, from 1942, June on, the Japanese are slowly going to be retreating back across the Pacific. Um, so Midway is a turning point in the war, um, relatively early. So the Japanese are going to be on the tr retreat, and the Americans are going to reconstruct their Pacific fleet, um, raise them from Pearl Harbor, um, and then go on the attack. Now, if you look at this picture, the empire of Japan is absolutely huge. It eats up a huge part of the globe, but most of it is water and islands. However, a lot of these islands are heavily fortified by Japanese forces. Um, and so the United States knows that we don't have the time or the resources or the men to take each one of these islands. And if we tried, it would take years and thousands and thousands of casualties. And so what uh, the United States Navy comes up with, a guy by the name of Admiral Nimitz, what they come up with is a plan called leapfrogging. It is our overall strategy for getting to Japan, for defeating, de uh, defeating Japan. And so what we're going to do is let's look at some of these islands on the map. And I'm just spitballing here because you can't see all of the islands. But let's pretend if you can see Wake Island, let's say that the Japanese have heavily fortified Wake Island. And so what the United States would do is they would avoid that island. They would leapfrog over it or go around it. Um, and they would attack a, a less fortified island behind it, let's say Saipan. 
and and then once they conquer Saipan, they're going to uh, leapfrog over other islands that are heavily, for, heavily fortified and maybe go to uh, another island. Um, and so we see this is the overall strategy for the United States. It avoids costly battles where the Japanese are definitely dug in and we just go behind those islands to the next island closer to Japan and we take that island. And eventually the Japanese on the heavily fortified islands, they're going to quote unquote wither on the vine. They're going to be slowly starved to death and have to surrender. And so this is what we do in 19 1942 and 43 and 44 and then eventually 45 we start to leapfrog our way across the Pacific using this strategy and it'll eventually pay off for the United States. So now let's switch to the other theater of war, the other front, it's the European theater. And in 1942, we see um, in this map that the Germans and the Italians have conquered everything that's in dark purple or lighter purple, and, they have, and that includes North Africa. And so the Germans are in control of most of continental Europe. And most of the fighting in 1942, 43, 44, and 45 in Europe is going to go on on the Eastern Front. The Russians, the Soviet Union, are going to um, occupy most of the German army um, in the war. And we can see on the right a picture of German soldiers burning Russian villages. Um, and so if you're Joseph Stalin, um, England and the United States are your allies, and so you're imploring the United States and the British to open up a second front in Europe. He wants the United States and the British to invade, as you can see on this map with the green arrow from England, he wants them to invade France. If we invade France, what that does is that's going to open up a second front for the Germans, and they're going to have to pull some of their troops off the eastern front where they're fighting with the Soviets to fight the Americans and the British. This will certainly help the Soviets out. And so this is the most important thing for Stalin. He wants the United States and the British to attack France, pulling those troops off the eastern front. But instead, the United States does not attack Europe, and they won't attack it for three more years frustrating Stalin. What we do first is we attack North Africa. The United States does this for their own reasons. We haven't built up our military yet. We don't have enough invasion fleet to invade France, so we can't do that yet, even though Stalin wants us to. And our troops are untested. They haven't been in battle since World War I, and so we decide to take on the, the less well-equipped, um, the less well-equipped, Equipped, sorry, that's Luna, my dog. The less well equipped army in Africa, in, uh, in Africa, the German troops. And we think this will be a little bit easier way to ease our way into the war. And so we attack North Africa and we win in North Africa with the British's help um, when we force the Germans out of North Africa, but that doesn't help Stalin. He's furious when he finds out that we invade North Africa and not Europe because it doesn't pull any German troops off the front. And every day, thousands and thousands of Russians are dying. Eventually, the Russians will lose about 20 million of their citizens in this war. So it's costing them heavily. So we see the United States here invading North Africa. Then what we have is the second, war, the second wartime conference um, in World War II. The first one, if you remember, was the Atlantic Conference, where FDR and Churchill decided what they were going to make the goals for the war, the Atlantic Charter. Well, here we have our second one. It's at Casablanca in northern Africa. And at Casablanca, FDR and Winston Churchill, as you see in the picture, they plan for the invasion, not of France again, but of Italy. Um, again, we're, the, we feel as Americans we're not ready to invade France yet, and so we take on the Italians in Italy and try to go what is called the soft underbelly of Europe. Um, if you notice, Stalin is not at this meeting. We are starting to offend Stalin. He wants us to invade Europe, uh, he, uh, Western Europe, France. Again, I said, because this will help pull troops off the front. But when we invade Italy, we're not fighting any Germans. We're fighting Italians for the most part. Um, and so this, once again, does not help Stalin. And Stalin believes, he's starting to be paranoid here. He starts to believe that the United States is really not trying to help him out. He thinks our strategy is to delay getting involved in the invasion of France so that the Soviets and the Nazis can kill each other, wipe each other out in this war, and then when they're both weak, the United States can come in and conquer all of Europe. Now that's not what our plan is, but Stalin is pretty paranoid and so he thinks it is. And so what I'm trying to create here in these notes is making the case for why the United States and the Soviet Union are starting to mistrust each other even though we're allies. 
What we'll find out is at the end of the war, the United States will be going from allies and friends with the Soviets to bitter enemies, the start of the Cold War. And I'm trying to lay the case out as we go through World War II why that happens. There's already mistrust um, and paranoia on both sides, even as we're quote unquote allies during the war. And so after we conquer much of Italy, finally we have our third wartime conference. It's called Tehran, um, the capital of Iran. Um, and so we finally have the big three. We have Stalin on the left in the picture, FDR in the middle, and Winston Churchill on the right. The big three, the Soviet Union, the United States, um, and Great Britain. And they meet together, and of course Stalin is advocating the, for the United States and Great Britain to finally open up that second front in Europe and attack France. And at this point, FDR feels that the United States has built up enough troops in England um, that, and we have enough amphibious invasion ships that we can actually pull off an invasion. And so at Tehran, that's where they plan for the invasion of France. And so on June 6th, 1944, the United States and the British will invade what is called Normandy. It's the northern part of France on D-Day. D stands for Day of Days. Um, and so we see on the bottom right-hand picture um, a photograph as troops are wading ashore one of the beaches at Normandy. They take a brutal uh, German fire. We lose a lot of troops. Um, and we eventually make a beachhead here. But notice the date. The United States gets involved in the war in 1941, but we don't actually start to open up that second front until 1944, just a year before the war is over. And so we see again that Stalin is begging and begging and pleading for the United States to do this, and finally we come through. We do make Stalin happy. I know he doesn't look very happy in the picture, but that's Stalin's happy face. Um, and But now we see that the war is not that far from over. There's going to be some heavy fighting in 1944, um, but now we are not that far from Germany. If you look at the map, the big black arrow, we're only one or two countries away from Germany. And so once the United States establishes a beachhead at Normandy, we're going to be driving for Germany. Now it's time for an election. So it's the election of 1944, right in the midst of the war, as the fighting is going to be the heaviest. We've just invaded um, Normandy, and it's time for a presidential election. And so the Republicans nominate Thomas Dewey. Thomas Dewey, his platform is he promises that he will finish the war. Well, of course, that's what he's promising. That's what Americans want. Um, and he also promises that when the war is over, we're going to have some kind of an international peace organization to avoid future wars. After all, we have fought two world wars in the first half of the 20th century. But this is exactly what FDR promised in his Atlantic Charter. So once again, for the third election, we see Republicans are kind of... Um, copying FDR. They're, they're letting him take the lead in what the direction of America is going to be. And for many Americans, once again, you have the choice of somebody who's like FDR Light, who's promising a lot of the things that FDR is pr promising, or you can have the original, you can have FDR. Um, and so FDR runs for his record-setting fourth term. And so we see this campaign poster says, I want you, FDR, to stay and finish the job. And most Americans are going to vote for FDR. He will win a fourth term. Even though he starts to lose some support, we'll see that on the next slide, but he is still popular enough because most Americans, they, they, they don't trust Thomas Dewey. They don't know anything about him. He's this unknown quantity, and we really want to, in the midst of a war, switch presidents. Most Americans are content with FDR. He got us through the Great Depression. He's got us through most of this war, and so they don't want to change right in the middle of the war. Now, FDR, he is failing rapidly as far as his health goes. We can see in this picture, he looks pretty gaunt, his eyes are su sunken, um, and being president is stressful. He has polio, so that's harsh on his body, but he also has been stressful. And we see that being a president is a very stressful job. Imagine being president in your fourth term after you've gone through the depression and the war, and he's just not feeling very well. He's having heart problems um, in addition to everything else. And so you would think that he would take great care in picking who his vice presidential candidate would be, but he doesn't really. He doesn't really even know the man he, he runs with. He picks a guy by the name of Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman is a machine politician from Missouri, and the reason FDR picks him is not because of his intellect or because of his leadership skills. He picks him because Truman is from a southern state. Missouri is typically known as a southern state, and he needs those southern Democrats to vote for him. If you remember the Fair Employment Practices Commission, FDR did that to make African Americans happy, um, but any time a Democratic president 
does something to make Democrat, African-American Democrats happy, he runs the risk of making white Democrats unhappy. And so it's always this balancing act for Democrats to try to keep African-Americans in the party by helping them but not helping them too much so that white Democrats leave. We're going to see this again and again as we go through future Democratic presidents. And so that's why he picks Truman. Um, now Truman, we're going to find out when he becomes president soon, he is woefully underprepared for the job. FDR never includes him in any of his briefings. Truman doesn't know most of the programs that are going on. And so here we see the election. Again, uh, FDR is going to win, but notice the farmers are starting to vote Republican again, and some of the Midwestern states are going back in the Republican camp, and FDR has only is down to now just 53, 54% of the popular vote. And so FDR is losing approval because people are getting nervous about his four terms. But like I said, most people just want to stay with FDR. They trust him. They want him to finish the job. And so let's finish the job. Section E, we have war in Europe comes to an end. Um, in December of 1944, as the United States has con reconquered or liberated most of France, they are pushing towards the homeland of Germany. Um, and so we see in the top right-hand corner, the United States is literally right on the border of what was pre-war Germany. Um, and the Germans, Hitler has saved his best troops for a counterattack, a counterpunch. And it's called the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge is where the Germans used their last best troops. Um, Hitler has saved up his gasoline that he has, his best troops, his best tanks. And his goal is to try to push back through the U.S. lines, creating this bulge where the U.S. start to weaken and retreat. Um, and he is going to break back out through Europe. But it can't last. The Germans just don't have enough fuel for their tanks and their machines. And the United States, with General Patton, famous World War II general, they will push the Germans back, and the Battle of Bulge will come to an end around Christmas time or so of 1944, early into January of 45. And this was really should be known as the Hitler's last desperate attempt to win the war. Once he loses the Battle of the Bulge, he's out of troops, um, he's out of gas, he's out of men, he's out of tanks and so it's not long for the war to be over and so we get the race for germany now of course america and the soviets want the war to end quickly but there's more to it than that once the battle of bulge is over everybody knows that the war is going to be over soon the germans are just out of everything we've bombed their cities we've bombed their factories and they're out of men and so the united states is going to push east as fast as we can on this map because we know that the further east we can go through europe if we can get our troops all the way to poland maybe even a little bit further into poland halfway into poland we would be able when the war ends wherever our tank and our army are that will be under u.s occupation Right? We want the war to be about spreading democracy, and so we know that if we conquer most of Europe when the war ends, that when the war is over, all those European countries will be under our care, our control, and we can turn them democratic and capitalistic and friends of ours. The same way the Soviets want to push as far west as they can. So they want to, when the war finally comes to an end, they want their troops maybe all the way to France. And if they can do that, then they'll stay in possession of Eastern Europe and they will turn Eastern Europe into communist countries that, that they can control and it'll act as a buffer zone between them and the rest of Europe. Remember, the Soviets have been invaded twice in this century, in World War I and World War II, and they want a big buffer zone between them and the rest of Europe. And so really, as the war comes to a close in 1945 in Europe, both the United States and their allies, the Soviet Union, they're kind of not acting as allies. Yes, they both want to finish the war, but they're both thinking about how they can cheat the other side of Europe when the war closes. We want a free democratic Europe. The Soviets want a communistic Europe that they can control and use as a buffer zone. And so the race is on to get as far into Germany and as Europe as you can. And so when the war comes to a close, we'll see what happens. So as the war, in the last final moments of the war, the United States and the Soviet Union and England, once again, the big three, they meet at a place called Yalta in the Soviet Union. And the goal of Yalta is not to discuss necessarily what to do about Germany. Germany is about ready to surrender. But it's what to do about Japan. Um, and every, many historians and Republicans are very critical of FDR at Yalta. If we can see in this picture... His health, like I said, is failing. He's very frail here, even though he keeps smoking. He's very frail. Um, and so at Yalta, FDR has one goal on his mind. He is desperate to get the Soviet Union to help him against the Japanese. 
as we get closer to the home islands of Japan and the war is winding down in the Pacific, American casualties are mounting and starting to go sky high. And he just doesn't know if the United States is going to have the will or the manpower or, or enough machines and technology to defeat uh, the Japanese. And so he wants the Russians, who have not declared war against the Japanese, they were only fighting the Nazis. That was keeping them occupied full time. And so he wants the Soviets, he wants to convince the Soviets to declare war against Japan. Now, Stalin is not going to give, give us help for nothing. Um, we may be allies, but we're not friends. And so he makes FDR at Yalta. He says, look, if I'm going to help you against the Japanese, you've got to give me some concessions in Europe. And so FDR says, well, what do you want? And Stalin says, I want your agreement that when the war against Germany is over, I'm going to be able to keep my troops, my tanks in Eastern Europe. And FDR says, well, for how long? And Stalin says, he lies here. He says, well, just temporarily. I promise I'll hold free elections at some point. Now, Stalin is not going to keep his word. Imagine that you can't trust a dictator. Um, but he says, look, you know, I will withdraw my troops eventually, and I will hold elections to let the people decide what kind of government they want. But for now, I want to keep my troops. FDR should have known something was up. I mean, Stalin is not known for his honesty. Um, and But he is so desperate to get the Soviets help against the Japanese that he says yes. Now, later on, when the war is over and the Soviets don't leave, like I said, people are going to be very critical of FDR for, quote-unquote, giving away Eastern Europe at Yalta. Some people say that he was weak. Some people say that he was sick. Some people say he just had poor planning here. Um, but you have to try to put yourself in FDR's shoes. He sees that the United States is really struggling with Japan, and that is number one on his priority. And so he rolls the dice a little bit about the future of Eastern Europe. He decides to trust Stalin which, as it turns out, was a bad move. All right. So just a few months later, we see FDR die. Um, and so we're going to see a new president, Harry Truman, become the president of the United States. More about that in a minute. But we also see the death of, of Hitler. Hitler commits suicide. The Soviets are about ready to take over Berlin, and he doesn't want to be captured by the Soviets because he knows they're going to probably torture him. Um, and so he decides to marry his longtime girlfriend, Eva Braun, and then they both kill themselves. And so once Hitler is dead, his, his German generals are desperate for peace. They even tried to convince Hitler to end the war earlier, but he wouldn't do it. And so now we're going to see victory in Europe, right? In May 8th of 1945, we have VE Day. We see that um, it's Victory in Europe Day. The Americans learn that Germany has surrendered unconditionally, and now the United States is only fighting a one-front war. So for a few days, we celebrate. Here's an iconic photograph of VE Day. It's in, it's in Times Square in New York, and this sailor, he's so happy. Um, he grabs this nurse that he sees. He doesn't know her, and he plants one right on her, gives her a big smooch. Um, she's married at the time, but you know everybody was celebrating. Um, and so we see people joyous, happy, laugh, laughing, because they know that one part of this war is over. But now the work begins to finish the war. And so the United States will keep lots of troops in Europe, but will start to send some of the troops, will shift them over to the war in the Pacific. So let's let's finish it up. The war in the Pacific comes to an end. So if we look at this map of the U.S. and we can see the green arrows showing American troop movements um, and naval movements across the Pacific, we see that the United States finally gets back to Japan. Um, here we see General MacArthur. He's waiting ashore in the, I'm sorry, not Japan, the Philippines. He's waiting ashore in the Philippines, and he says to his troops, look, I promised you I'll return, and he says, I have returned. The problem is none of those troops he left behind are on that beach to greet him. They've all been sitting in prisoner of war camps for years. And um, I didn't include any pictures of these prisoner of wars because it's pretty gruesome. Um, these American POWs were starved to death. They were emaciated. They were beaten. Um, they were tortured. Um, and so we see that, yes, MacArthur is back, but I don't know if that makes the troops all that happy in the Philippines. Perhaps. Um, but we now see that the Philippines are back under U.S. control. And look on the map how close we are to the home island of Japan when we get to the Philippines. So the United States starts to have, they start, they can't leapfrog anymore. The closer we get, we have to take some islands that we just can't jump over. They're islands that are strategic. They're big islands that we could put air, face, air force bases on. One of those islands is Iwo Jima. And you can see it on the map right there at Okinawa. These are huge battles where the United States Marine Corps and the Army, they land on these 
these islands, um, amphibious assaults, and we just get shredded on the beaches. But we can't quit, um, and we have to take the island. And eventually we do. If you remember the first, um, the first part of this lecture, we had that iconic photograph of the Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima, um, saying American victory. It was a well-earned victory. It was a tough victory. But now the Americans have the island of Iwo Jima, which is within flying distance of Japan. And the United States round-the-clock bombing of the cities of Japan. Civilian casualties will be enormous in Japan, but we're also trying to bomb factories so that the Japanese just cannot produce tanks and planes and flamethrowers and whatever anymore. And if we keep bombing their factories, eventually the Japanese will just run out of war materials. And they are. Uh, and so the Japanese realize that they're going to have to make every plane they have still count. Um, every bomb hit its target. So the closer we get to the home islands of Japan, the Japanese start to engage in kamikaze attacks, which means they take the few pilots they have with the few planes and bombs they have, and what they do is they have these pilots take suicide attacks. They fly the plane right into American ships, killing a thousand Americans at a time when a ship, ship goes down or more. And so we see, like I said, American casualties are mounting. Now, put this with what we talked about at Yalta, and this is what is facing FDR. He understands that the closer we get to, uh, to Japan, the more American casualties are going to mount, and he doesn't believe that we can beat the Japanese, just us and the British alone. He needs the Soviet Union's help, as you can see on the map is right there. And so he hopes that the Soviet Union will declare war, and um, after VE Day, the Soviet Union did declare war. Now the Soviet Union is gearing up to open up a second front on the Japanese. So then we talk about the Manhattan Project. Now, during FDR's presidency, he had some scientists led by this guy by the name of Oppenheimer. We see him on the slide here, um, at least his name. And it is composed of American scientists and German scientists. The reason we have a lot of German physicists on American soil working on this project is because um, Hitler was persecuting the Jews and going through his Holocaust. And so these um, amazing physicists who were Jew German, German Jewish scientists, they fled Germany and came to the United States and they helped us work on the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the code name, the secret name for the secret uh, um, program to develop the atomic bomb. Now, the physicists have assured FDR that this is feasible. It's a super weapon. Um, and so it was in project, it was, it was in uh, the works when FDR died, and it actually starts out the Manhattan Project in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, underneath their football stadium. And that's fine as long as it's in the theoretical st stages. But what happens is when we start to go from theoretical to experimental, we can't start experimenting with the atomic bomb in Chicago. We don't want to blow up the city. And so they move the whole project out to the deserts of New Mexico at Los Alamos. They figure if we blow up accidentally there, then not a lot of people will die. It's in the desert. So comforting. Now, the thing that's interesting about this project is that we didn't invite the Soviets. We didn't even tell the Soviets about it. So, of course, the Soviets have spies there, as we can see on the slide, and Stalin, this feeds his paranoia. He knows about this weapon through these, um, these spies that they have in Los Alamos, and he knows it's a super weapon. And the only thing he can think of is why aren't the, isn't the United States sharing this technology with her ally, the Soviets? We, um, well, because we must be planning to use it on them. And so we see, again, this growing distrust between us and the Soviets, quote-unquote, allies. Um, and so all of this is going on when um, Truman takes over. And so Truman's very first wartime conference, it'll be the fourth of out, of, out of our five wartime conferences, happens in Potsdam, Germany. Now, by this point, Germany has surrendered. It's July 1945. And the big three, Stalin um, of the Soviet Union, Truman of the United States, and Winston Churchill of Great Britain, they meet together to talk about the war in the Pacific. And at the beginning of the of the of the meeting, Truman is being criticized because he's acting very shy and he's letting Stalin kind of bully him. After all, he is the new kid on the block here. He just got this job. He just found out about the Manhattan Project himself. He doesn't really know what's going on in the war. And so Stalin smells weakness and he starts bullying Truman. He says that you will let us stay in Eastern Europe. And while we have Eastern Europe, you're going to give us more. And, and Truman just kind of takes it until at the conference he gets a note and he opens the note, he reads the note, and then he closes the note and puts it away, and all of a sudden Truman 
finds a backbone. Truman says, now you wait here. And he's a southerner, so he has a somewhat of a southern accent. And he says, you wait here, Stalin. You can't tell me what to do. And he starts yelling at Stalin. And Stalin, and he starts saying, you need to back down, back off. Um, and so we see, you know, this magical transformation of Truman. Well, what was in the note? The note said, the device works. At that point, Truman found out that we have an atomic bomb. We have a weapon that can kill a whole city with one bomb. He knows that the United States has a weapon that could end World War II with just one or two drops of a bomb. Um, and so at this point, we see the United States policy towards Japan and the Soviet Union change dramatically. Truman does not want to see communism spread into East Asia like it has spread into Eastern Europe. And so Truman wants to end the war now, today, quickly. And so he says at Potsdam, that's why he's bullying the Soviets, because he you knows he doesn't need their help anymore. We could end the war with a couple of these bombs. And he doesn't want the Soviets. Every day the war drags on means the Soviets are going to get more and more territory in East Asia, turning it communist. And he says, I'll be damned if I'm going to fight this war just to defeat Hitler and then lose Eastern Europe and Japan to the communists. He says, we've been fighting this war in the Pacific this whole time, not the Soviets, and I'm not going to share it with the Soviets. And so we see Truman is desperate to end this war as quick as possible. And so number five, Russia enters the Pacific theater. Here in the map, we see Russia starting to attack China on their way to Japan. And again, like I said, Truman doesn't want the, the, the Russians to get any more territory in East Asia than they can. And so he is going to decide to drop the bomb. And so the first place we drop the bomb is on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Some people call it Hiroshima. I've heard it pronounced more often Hiroshima, whatever. So we see we drop the bomb. Now, the reason we chose the Japanese city of Hiroshima is because, one, there's a, there's a, it's a military base. And there's also factories that produce things for the Japanese war effort. So it's a legitimate military target, but it also has lots of civilians in it. And that's not why we dropped the bomb there, but this is modern war. We understand that if you kill the civilians, they can't work in the factories. Um, and so it does cripple Japan's effort to wage war. Um, now, right before we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, the Japanese government was trying to surrender. They were talking to the United States. They understand they're losing the war. They don't know anything about the atomic bomb. It's secret. But they know that we're getting close to the home island of Japan. And so they were making, they were putting out feelers to the United States and said, look, what can we do to bring this war to an end? And the United States says, unconditional surrender. Our public demands that you surrender and we get to occupy your country. We are angry about Pearl Harbor. We are angry about the Bataan Death March. We are angry about all these battles. We want complete, unconditional, total surrender by the Japanese. And they're just not willing to do that. They don't want to give up their emperor. They don't want U.S. occupation. And so the peace talks are going nowhere. And so, again, time is ticking. Truman doesn't want the Soviets to get any more territory. So he drops the bomb on Hiroshima. So the rest, much of the rest of this slide is talking about the reasons why Truman drops the bomb. As you can imagine, it's a horrible device. It's going to kill a lot of people. Um, we are the only country in human history to use the bomb in wartime. And so historians um, and people have been very critical of Truman's use of this weapon. And so this slide is all about why does Truman do it. So I've already told you that he doesn't want the Soviets getting involved in East Asia. We've also already told you that the American public is demanding unconditional surrender. So he doesn't want to mess with this. He wants unconditional surrenders, and the Japanese are just not giving it to him. But there's another thing, too. Truman's admirals and his generals are giving him estimates of what they think it'll cost America to conquer the home islands of Japan. And the estimates of American casualties are over a million men. And Truman, after the war is over, he said this was the most important reason he dropped the bomb. He said that his responsibility was to the American people. He needed to save American lives. And there was no question in his mind he was going to use it. He has the super weapon. It would end the war today, save perhaps a million American casualties, and he decides he's going to do it. Next, we, we've already talked about those two things. Then we see Poland. Now you wonder, what on earth does Poland have to do with the decision to drop the bomb on Japan? Well, you remember at Yalta, FDR, quote-unquote, gave away Eastern Europe, and that's where Poland is. It's in Eastern Europe. And so we've agreed to let the Soviets stay in Eastern Europe, quote-unquote, temporarily. But Truman knows darn well that Stalin is not going to get out of Eastern Europe, which is Poland. And so he believes that if he drops the bomb, or at least this is what historians have, have theorized, 
They believe that he, Truman thought if he drops the bomb on Hiroshima and the Soviets, who he doesn't know understand know about this weapon, he, we don't know about their spies. If the Soviets find out about this bomb and see the incredible destructive power of this new super weapon the United States has, we can use the atomic bomb to bully the Soviets and push them out of Eastern Europe. We can threaten them and say, look, did you see what we did to Japan? You might want to get out of Eastern Europe because we might do it to you too. And so we see historians think that this is another reason why he dropped the bomb on Japan was to get the Soviets out of Eastern Europe. We also talked about the, the idea of saving lives. And so we do see the United States on August 6th, 1945, they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Um, the name of the plane that drops it is called the Enola Gay. We don't need to know this for our test, but it is a common piece of knowledge that you might hear just in your life. Um, and so the Enola Gay, it's a big heavy bomber, it drops the bomb and there's this tremendous flash. And the city of Hiroshima disappears. If we see pictures of the city um, in the bottom right hand corner, you see that there's very few buildings left standing. Some miraculously survived, but we just release atomic energy and it's an uncontrolled chain reaction and it just devastates the city. So instantaneously, thousands of Japanese just disappear. They are consumed by the tremendous heat, ap approaching heat that you might find on the sun, um, and so they're just wiped out. Then outside the city, the further out you go, those people are going to start dying within a few days or a few weeks. They may have looked fine, they're happy they survived the initial attack, but then a few days later they start to get burns, like they stayed out too long in the sun, and the burns don't get better, they just keep getting worse, and then people's hair starts to fall out, fall out and their teeth and what they're suffering from is radiation poisoning. And so this bomb is such a horrible device, not just, just because it incinerated all those people, but because it's going to have impacts on people way outside the city as they were impacted by the radiation. But that's not all. This device will also affect the Japanese for years to come because even if you didn't die of radiation sickness, it's gonna cause long-term rates of cancer and birth defects in future generations. And so we see again, Historians and people since the dropping of the bomb have criticized Truman for you unleashing this horrible device on mankind, and it does require us to pause and think about it. Um, on the other side, Truman is saying all of the reasons he dropped the bomb, and the number one reason was he wanted to end the war to save American lives. And perhaps, who knows, maybe in the long run, it did save Japanese lives as well, because the war will come to a close soon, but not right away. Um, so let's go back just a second. The Japanese don't immediately surrender on August 6th or even August 7th. The Japanese government has to have time to get in and see the, def the, the destruction. But we don't wait very long to drop another bomb on Nagasaki. And this is where historians really criticize Truman more. They say, look, if you're trying to save American lives and all of these other reasons, fine. You know, maybe that's why he dropped the first bomb. But why drop the second bomb just a few days later? He didn't even give the Japanese time to get in and look at the devastation and really think about surrendering. He drops a second bomb quickly. And so historians think that this is really where Poland comes in. They believe that Truman dropped the second bomb because he wants the Soviets to understand that this wasn't a fluke thing, that we have a whole arsenal of these things, and if we can drop one, we can drop ten. Um, and so he wants, he's bluffing, he wants the Soviets to think that we could drop these bombs at any time. Now the interesting thing is, and the Soviets knew this, we only had two bombs. They take a long time to make, um, they're very expensive, and so we're trying to build more, but we only had two. Um, and so historians would say he dropped the second bomb as a bluff to try to convince the Soviets, look, we got more of these bombs, we could use them on you, get out of Eastern Europe, stop your invasion of, you know, into the Pacific theater. Um, and so he drops the second bomb. So now when we drop the second bomb, that's it. Japan is convinced. So on August 14th, they surrender unconditionally. It's called VJ Day, Victory in Japan. And World War II comes to a close. Japan is destroyed. The Soviet Union is destroyed. France, Germany, England, 
all wiped out. Many of them look like the city that you see in the picture on the bottom right-hand corner. And the only country that is going to emerge from World War II stronger economically than it was before, nearly untouched by the war, will be the United States. And we'll talk about that's impact on U.S. foreign policy and U.S. economy um, in our next set of notes. But before we end this, Let's talk about one more thing. We see this picture on the bottom right-hand corner, and of course I've been talking about how Truman's been criticized for this. But this is not unique. The United States dropped all kinds of bombs on Germany too, the most famous being the firebombing in Dresden. Dresden is a city in Germany, and we dropped so many bombs. These were special bombs called incendiary devices. These were bombs that were designed to make fire, and there are reports that we dropped so many bombs on this German city of Dresden that there were columns, tornadoes of fire raging through the city. People died from lack of oxygen. The fires just sucked up the oxygen, killing thousands of citizens. This is the horrible nature of World War II. It wasn't just atomic bombs, but it was firebombing too. It was treatment of the, the U.S. soldiers in Bataan. Uh, we'll find out it's genocide in the Holocaust. This is the world's most destructive war, and it's going to have a profound impact on not just the U.S., but the entire world, and what kind of world we want to create after it. So more about that when we come back in our next lecture.